Here in the book of Acts, we begin reading in verse 1. We read through verse 8, but then again, skipping the pericope concerning Simon the sorcerer, we will drop down to verse 26 and then read through the end of the chapter. Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 1, let us hear then the word of the Lord. On that day, this was the time when Stephen was stoned to death as the first martyr of the New Testament church. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah, the Christ, there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city." And now, dear friends, drop down with me, please, to verse 26 of that chapter, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. And on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture, and he told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Thus far, the reading of God's holy word. And as always, dear friends, I ask and urge you to keep your Bibles open and handy as we look to God's word together today. Dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, question, does the name Edward Kimball mean anything to you? The name Edward Kimball? If so, let me see your hands. Okay, no one, (laughs) okay. Uh, Does the name D.L. Moody mean anything to you? If you've heard that name, let me see your hands. Oh, okay, just, I think just about everybody. Well, friends, this is interesting because humanly speaking, if there had not been an Edward Kimball, we probably never would have heard of D.L. Moody. How so? Well, I'll explain it to you. According to what I have read, way back in the year 1855, April in America, Mr. Edward Kimball was 40 years of age and he learned that he was seriously ill. In fact, he was told that he did not have long to live. He was not a very highly educated man, but he willingly served to teach a a Sunday school class of 15 young boys and he continued doing that. His pastor preached a sermon on the importance of witnessing and evangelizing the faith to try to share the gospel with others. And he became incredibly burdened to do just that with those young boys in his Sunday school class. 
Again, according to what I had read, he overcame a great deal of personal fear to do that. And one day he walked into a shoe store. He went back in the stock room and he found one of the young boys in his class named Dwight. And he led him to the Lord. That young boy named Dwight was D.L. Moody, who became one of the greatest evangelists this country has ever known. Now, friends, interestingly enough, that same dynamic is very powerfully portrayed for us here in the book of Acts, the eighth chapter, especially in the words of our text, verses 26 through 40. You see, here we find ourselves being moved and motivated by the fact that just as was true for this layman turned evangelist named Philip some 2,000 years ago. So too, you and I must pray for the grace to be able to hear and heed all of the commandments and precepts of God's Word in each and every area of life. Also, and especially in those areas of life which are related to the great commission which Christ gave to His church to go and make disciples of all nations. And indeed, those areas of life related to the theme text of Acts 1-8, when Jesus commissioned us to be His witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now friends, as we begin to work our way through the words of our text together, we'll find that God will indeed be gracious to us and enable and equip us to be found faithful in hearing and heeding His commands in hearing and heeding the commission to go and share the gospel, to make disciples of all nations, to be His witnesses beginning at home and going far and wide as the Lord may enable us. And we will do so as we carefully consider three practical principles that are very powerfully portrayed in this gospel-spreading, kingdom-building, Christ-exalting encounter between Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, between Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, if you're taking notes, you may wish to jot down that principle number one is that like Philip of old, you and I must increasingly learn to submit to God's will, to submit to God's will. For example, look at verse 26 of Acts 8 with me, if you would, please. Here we read, now an angel, the Greek says now an angelos, as in the city of Los Angeles, the city of angels, uh, boys and girls, that word angelos or angel literally means a messenger. That's essentially what an angel is, a messenger. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now friends, if you've got your own Bible and you have some maps in the back, you may want to go back to a map of the early church and, and look there at the promised land. And if you find Jerusalem down in the uh, Judea area, go about 50 miles southwest from Jerusalem and you'll find Gaza right on the shore of the Mediterranean Sea. And that is the, tr the route that, that uh, this messenger, this, this angel, told Philip to take to go down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now notice, as soon as he gets that divine directive, we read in verse 27, so he started out. The Lord sent him a message through that angel, and it says, so he started out. Instant obedience. Now drop down with me, please, to verse 29, where it says the Spirit told Philip. Now this is the third person of the Blessed Trinity, the Holy Spirit, equally fully God. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot. And, and this is a word in the original that could refer to a war chariot, but it also refers to kind of a, a stagecoach type chariot, a, a traveling carriage, if you will. That's probably what it was. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it, and stay near it. I think um, uh, King James Version, some of the others uh, say something like, join yourself to it, join yourself to it. It's, it's a word in the original that literally means uh, be glued together. Go to that chariot and, and be glued to it. Just, just, just stay, stay right on it, stay right on it. And then we read in verse 30, then Philip ran up to the chariot. Boys and girls, why did he have to run? Well, the guy was in a chariot. He was being pulled by horses. It was on the move. And he had to run after it to catch up to it and then glue himself to it. But friends, again, he gets the command from the Spirit, go to that chariot, stay near it. And then Philip ran to that chariot. He ran up to that chariot. Instant obedience. Instant obedience. In fact, I don't think it's reading too much into the text that when we see Philip responds so instantaneously, there seems to be almost an, an eagerness, if you will, having heard the word of the Lord, to heed the word of the Lord and to do exactly what he commanded him to do, to do exactly what he commanded him to do. 
And brothers and sisters, I guess that, that begs the question for you and for me, does it not? Are you and I like Philip in that regard? In other words, as you and I may be reading God's word, meditating on God's word, memorizing God's word, praying to the Lord after having read the word. Did you ever have a time when the Holy Spirit really burdens your heart or inclines your heart to do something seemingly out of the out of the, the roots of what we had, had, had done, sinking our, our roots down in the word of God and in prayer to him. And, and he kind of is inclining us. We're almost hearing him say to us, Rich, John, Susie, I, I want you to go and whatever. Or we may read a specific command, a precept in God's word. I command you to. Do we, do we not only hear that, but do we heed it? Do we go and do it? We may have a burden the Lord gives us by his word and spirit to, to, to maybe improve our stewardship of the time we have in, on this earth and in this life. We may feel the spirit burdening us to, to be a more faithful steward of the talents he's given us. And, and this room has represented hundreds of talents and gifts and abilities God has given us. If he burdens us to, to up our stewardship of that, do we, do we obey the treasures he's given us, <laughs> the suits? <laughs> Do we, do we take our property, our possessions, our money and say, Lord, it's, it's not mine. It's thine. It's thine. When we hear that command, that call, that commission, do we obey? Do we obey or not? You know, uh, having grown up in New Jersey, living right across the river from New York City, I was quite familiar with Mayor Ed Koch. How many of you remember Mayor Ed Koch? Oh, wow, several. Okay, many of you. He served as mayor in New York City from 1978 to 1989. And often when he'd be, be uh, interviewed by reporters, either at the beginning or the end of the interview, he would ask a question. <laughs> and he would do it with a smile on his face. And he did it all the time. Does anybody remember what Ed Koch always used to say? Oh yeah, <laughs> exactly right. I, I didn't even hear who said it. But it was, yeah, yeah, he would go, he'd go, how am I doing? How am I doing? Well, friends, how... How am I doing when it comes to hearing and heeding God's word, the burdens he lays on my heart, the commands he gives in his law? How are you doing when it comes to hearing and heeding the burdens God lays on your heart, the commands he gives in his law? How are we doing in that regard as a fledgling flock which the Lord has so providentially placed here in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania? How are we doing? How are we doing? Well, you know, brothers and sisters, it's interesting. No matter who we are, no matter how the Lord may be burdening our hearts or what he may be commanding us to do today, there are profound implications as to whether we obey or not. In fact, I'm going to illustrate it this way from a, an example early on in my ministry at Pompton Plains. Probably 25 or so years ago, I'm at home studying in my home study, and I get a phone call from one of the young men in the congregation. I'm only going to say his first name since um, it's being recorded, but many of you may recall who I'm talking about. Some of you may. His name was Keith. Keith called me up, and he sounded quite distraught, and he said, Pastor Rich, I need you to come over right away. I said, okay. So I went out of the house, jumped in the car, drove the short distance to Keith's house. Stephanie, his wife, greeted me at the door. I said, where's Keith? She said, he's upstairs, top of the stairs. I said, okay, I'll go right up. So I go up the stairs, and I see Keith sitting on the bathroom floor, and he's got pipes and wrenches and boxes all over the place. He's obviously working on some plumbing. And I said to him, Keith, if you're looking for help with this, you are calling the wrong guy. I'll tell you that right now. I know nothing. I know nothing about this. He goes, no, 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 this is not why I called you. It's much more important than that. And I said, well, what's the problem? And he said, Pastor, I'm Jonah. I'm Jonah. So I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is deep. I'm thinking of, of, of Jonah being thrown into the sea. I'm thinking of the plumbing, the water. I'm trying to you know, tie, it all, <laughs> tie it all together. And nothing's, nothing's making any sense. I said, Keith, I'm sorry. I, really, I don't know what you're talking about. He goes, I'm Jonah. I said, what do you mean by that? I'm Jonah. He said, the Lord has laid on my heart for about three or four years a call to the ministry. And I've been suppressing it. I've been saying no. I've been 
putting it down. And he said, it's making me more and more guilt ridden. It's making me more and more depressed. And he said, I, I just can't live with myself. And I think I'm going to have to go. So we prayed together and talked a while. And as some of you may recall, it wasn't long before Keith left a very lucrative paying job in a major a payroll company. Packed up the kids. He and Steph moved to uh, Jackson, Mississippi. He enrolled at RTS, Reformed Theological Seminary. And uh, after seminary, he received a call to Slidell, Louisiana, and uh, the PCA congregation. And, I, and he asked me to come down to speak at his ordination, and it was during Mardi Gras week. <laughs> and I, there's, some, there's some things I'm not going to share about right now about that, but um, I'm on the plane going down to, uh, <laughs> to uh, New Orleans, and uh, sitting next to a young, young guy on in the, in the plane, you get talking, and I try to not let him know I'm a minister because then they stop talking to you. So um, I just said, so what do you do? He said, I'm a, I'm a plastic surgeon. I said, no kidding. Young guy, maybe 35. I said, no kidding. He said, yeah, I was in a very difficult, uh, serious car accident uh, when I was 20 years old. And the doctors, you know, put me back together, and it burdened my heart to want to go do this. And so I'm, a, I'm a, uh, a, you know, a doctor like that. And uh, he said, I go down to New Orleans every year with my friends. I said, no kidding. He says, yeah, I go down during Mardi Gras. I'm just quoting him now. Okay, I'm not, he's saying this. He said, I go down every year because there's nothing like a week of sin and debauchery to clear your head. And so, so he says, so what do you do? <laughs> I said, I'm a minister. Goes, oh, no, no, oh, no. I can't believe I did. I'm so sorry. I'm like, no, it's okay. If that's your life, you know, we need to talk. But anyway, um, I told him I was going down there because a friend was being ordained. And he goes, who gets ordained during Mardi Gras? I said, well, well, Keith is. But, but the point is, th th is this. And I want each of us to look into our own heart on this. And I'm going to ask the question in relation to what Keith told me that day. Are you Jonah? <laughs> Are you Jonah? Am I Jonah? Is there something the Lord has laid on our heart, a command, a precept, a calling, a commission, a burden to share the gospel with a, a classmate, a co-worker, a family member, a friend, somebody who's just lost? But we're Jonah. God told us to go southwest and we went northeast. <laughs> he, says, he says, you know, go to Nineveh and he heads, you know, the other way. Are you Jonah? Am I Jonah? Friends, the reason this is so serious is because our Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says not, and we looked at this text a couple of weeks ago, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And again, in John 14, 15, Jesus declares, if you love me, you will obey what I command. If you love me, you will obey what I command. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And friends, that is the first very practical principle that is so powerfully portrayed in this riveting encounter between Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Submission to God's will. Well, as our text continues here in Acts chapter 8, we find that a second practical principle so powerfully portrayed is that we also must be sensitive to God's ways. We must be sensitive to God's ways. For example, do you recall from our earlier uh, study of, of Acts 8, what, or from when we read it a moment ago, what was Philip doing and where was he doing it prior to this command to go to the desert road? He was in Samaria. He was in a major city. He's preaching to throngs of people. He is spiritually and physically healing the lame, the paralyzed, the sick, the, the demon possessed. And crowds are gathering around and, and, and there was great joy in the city. And it seemed as if, as if Philip was at the very top of his game, if you will that he was being most, the most effectively and fruitfully being used of God as anyone could imagine. And it was at that moment, the Bible says, that he gets this command in verse 26, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Go to the desert road. Right as I'm being used to touch thousands of people, heal them, praise God, people being saved. Go to the desert road. Why? Reason, I believe, is found, for example, way back in the Old Testament in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. If you want to turn there with me, it's page 636 in the Maroon Bible, page 636, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. I think this is why. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, page 636. 
For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. That's why. Philip had to understand that. You and I <laughs> need to understand that. God's ways, his thoughts are, are, are higher than ours. In fact, not only did, did God send him to a desert road, he sends him to one individual person. Think about this. That shows us how incredibly important each and every single soul is to the Lord our God. And friends, how important every single soul needs to be to you and to me as well when it comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. In fact, let's go back to the text there together in, verse, uh, in chapter 8, and let's pick it up in verse 27. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of the treasury of, this NIV says, of the Candake, the King James and other translations say of Candace, which means queen of the Ethiopians. Candace, friends, was the dynastic title of all of the queens of the Ethiopians. And because her husband and son were considered to be children of the son, S-U-N, they were too sacred, too holy to engage in politics, to engage in secular affairs. So Candace was the one who was really running the government and running the country. And he, he was in charge of her treasury. It says, this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. I have a footnote here in my study Bible which says that is from the southern Nile region. This man was from an area south of uh, Egypt, just south of Egypt, what is modern day Sudan. He was probably a, quite a dark skinned fellow. He probably was not yet a proselyte or a Gentile con convert to Judaism, but he was what they were calling a God fearer. He, he had a sense of God. He had a sense of the fear of God. He probably went to synagogue. He probably was reading the scriptures, as we see here, as a, as a custom. But he didn't know Christ as Savior and Lord. And so he's just driving along uh, here. The man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And on his way home, notice, he was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of the prophet Isaiah. Boys and girls, he was reading out loud. How do we know that? Because when we search the scriptures, we find in verse 30 that Philip heard him reading. So he was reading out loud, as was the custom of the day. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and be glued to it. <laughs> Stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. Now, friends, think about that. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. Why is that important? It's important because it gives us a key witnessing strategy. To begin sharing the gospel by asking a question. And to begin where the people are. And to begin where the people are. For example, somebody loses a family member or a friend. And you ask them, how are you doing? How are you feeling? I went through that myself years ago, you may say. How are you coping? Are you uh, coping pretty well with the COVID pandemic? Has it cost you your job? Are you making it financially? Or is there a way that I can help? I heard you're having surgery. How are you feeling? Nervous, scared, anxious? I can share some scripture with you if you'd like of how to cast those cares on the Lord knowing that he cares for you. Your wife tells me that you've been depressed lately. I know what that's like. I went through that myself several years ago. Do you mind me sharing with you what Help me get through it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Start with the people are. Start by asking a question. <laughs> That's what Philip did. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked in verse 31. Look with me. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Think of that, this, this high, high official. How can I understand it unless someone explains it to me? And so he got up in the chariot with him. How could that possibly be? Because this encounter was providentially planned by our sovereign saving God. That's why. This encounter was providentially planned by our sovereign saving God. In fact, I think it was uh, James Montgomery Boyce who said, there are no accidents in the life of God's people. There are no accidents in the life of God's people. It's true. 
Dr. R.B. Kuyper, writing in his book, God-Centered Evangelism, said this. He notes this, and I quote. He said, God sees the things of tomorrow as if they had occurred yesterday. With God as leader, there is no room for despair. There is room only for strong faith, firm hope, and ardent love. End of quote. And that's true. And friends, that is why even though there are times in our lives when we may not understand God's will, we have to pray for the grace to be sensitive to God's ways, to be sensitive to God's ways. Well, as our text continues and concludes, there's a very, third very practical principle so powerfully portrayed in this encounter between Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, and that is that we must pursue the graciously God-given ability to share God's word, to share God's word. For example, look at verse 32 as our text picks up in Acts chapter 8. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. And friends, you probably noted when we read the passage he was reading from Isaiah, if you were to pick an Old Testament passage from the whole Old Testament that spoke of Christ, this would probably be the text. This would probably be the text. Imagine that at that moment, that man was reading that text, right as, as Philip comes along. God ordained it all. God ordained it all. He read the passage. It, he was like a sheep to the slaughter, led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Boys and girls, this is a prophecy concerning Jesus 800 years B.C. Think of this. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture. He began with that very passage of Scripture. He began where the man was. <laughs> Remember, he began where the man was. That's what Jesus did. To people who are hungry, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. When people were thirsty, he said, I, I give living water. When Mary and Martha were grieving outside the tomb of their dear brother Lazarus, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. You see, he began where, where the man was. Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture, and then it says, and he told him the good news about Jesus. The King James Version, some of the other versions say more literally, and he preached Jesus to him. He preached Jesus to him. It's that Greek word we saw earlier in this, in this, uh, in this book. Alangalizo. It's where we get our word evangelism from. It means to declare good news. And why is it good news? Well, well boys and girls, this passage from Isaiah sets forth the, the great exchange that took place on Calvary's cross. Our sins were laid on Christ. And His righteousness was credited to us, imputed to us by God's grace alone, through faith alone. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. All glory be to God. He preached Jesus to him. He preached Jesus to him. Think about that. And what's interesting too, it says in verse 35, then Philip began with that passage of Scripture. He started where the man was, but that was only the start. Friends, he may have gone back to Genesis and talked about the fact that Jesus was the seed of the woman who would crush the serpent's head. He may have gone into Exodus and said, Jesus is our Passover lamb. He may have gone into Leviticus and said, Christ is our great high priest. He may have gone into Deuteronomy and said, he's our city of refuge. He may have gone into Joshua and said, he's our commander who leads us to the promised land. He may have gone to the Psalms and said, Jesus is the good shepherd of the sheep. He may have gone to Daniel, boys and girls, and said, he was the fourth man in the fire. He began with that passage of scripture and he preached Jesus to him. He preached Jesus to him. Friends, as I've been prayerfully pondering that, that reality, I asked myself this, could I do that? <laughs> could I do that? Could you do that? Preach Jesus to somebody, starting where they are. Just thinking about my life and uh, how blessed I have been in so many ways, being born to Christian parents, Christian grandparents, raised in a Christian home. My parents sacrificed like crazy to send me to a Christian school, faithful Christian church, youth group, Sunday school, catechism, classes, all the rest. Christian college, the King's College, godly professors. And I think of all the ways I've been taught the Word of God, the things of God, since infancy, like Timothy. And friends, we can tend to take that all in. Now we've got, you know, you know, 
what do you call podcasts and we go on the internet, we can listen to sermons 24 hours a day if we wanted from all over the world. Reading God's word, devotional books, as well we should. Praise God, as well we should. But did it ever occur to you that we could just keep being fed and fed and fed and fed and all of a sudden we just turn spiritually fat? When God feeds us so we can go feed somebody else. He feeds us so we can go feed somebody else. So Philip did. In fact, there's a very convicting verse in Luke 12, 20, Luke 12, 48, if you're taking notes, Luke 12, 48, where Jesus says, From everyone who has been given much, much more will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Much more will be asked. Beginning in that very passage of Scripture, he preached Jesus to him. He shared with him the good news about Jesus. Text con continues and concludes, look with me please. As they traveled along the road, verse 36, they came to some water and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. Was he immersed? Maybe. Was he poured upon? Maybe. Was he sprinkled? Maybe. All modes are legitimate. In fact, the great Puritan Matthew Henry surmises this. It's just Matthew Henry's uh, thought. He says, and I quote, Going barefoot according to custom, they went perhaps up to the ankles or mid-leg into the water and Philip sprinkled water on him, representing the sprinkling of the blood of Christ that we read about in Old and New Testament. Well, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Did you notice back in Samaria when Philip was preaching Christ, this whole city rejoiced? Now this eunuch finds Christ and he's rejoicing because joy is one of the key, key parts of fruits of the Holy Spirit. I think I shared with you several weeks ago that I read somewhere that joy is the flag that is flown from the castle of the heart when the king is in residence there. If we are in Christ, we should have a joy that withstands the storms of life because we have the Holy Spirit of the living God. He went on his way rejoicing. John Calvin, the great reformer, says, and I quote, For it cannot be, but that so soon as we know that God will be favorable and merciful to us, that our mind shall be wrapped with uncomparable joy, as such as doth far pass all understanding. End of quote. It's true. All glory be to God. Philip, however, as our text concludes, appeared at Azatoth seemingly in miraculous fashion. The Spirit seemingly whisked him away. If you read the earlier verse there, um, Philip uh, suddenly appeared at Azatoth seemingly and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Until he reached Caesarea. And we'll pick up there, Lord willing, next week. But you know, friends, I've been thinking about this, having prayerfully pondered this passage this week. One day, when we get to heaven, by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, there's going to be an Ethiopian eunuch there who is there, humanly speaking, because of the witness of a layman named Philip. And that begs the question, when you and I who are in Christ, get to heaven. Will there be someone there? Anybody. Anybody. Who was there because by the grace and mercy of God, you and I submitted to God's will, were sensitive to God's ways, and were obedient in spreading the word. Well, friends, as you and I leave this place, May God grant us the grace to go forth living these lessons and practicing these principles which were so powerfully portrayed in this kingdom-building, Christ-exalting, gospel-spreading encounter between Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Amen. Let's bow our heads and our hearts together in prayer. You did not choose me, said Jesus, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. O oh, faithful Father, 
when our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ returns on the clouds of glory to judge the living and the dead, may each and every one of us individually, and may we as a fledgling flock corporately be found both faithful and fruitful before your face. Hear us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.